Uh, our next speaker is uh, George Whitesides. He's uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Virgin Galactic. George has quite a history. He was actually at the first Mars Society convention, and I, I believe in 1998. And George is also the uh, Executive Director of the National Space Society. In fact, I worked with him in 2006. I was leading the tour to Mojave Spaceport, and couldn't get very many places to open the doors. And I called George. Before you know it, x welcomed us in where they were just stonewalling us before. So um, this is a man who can get things done. I couldn't get scaled composites to open, or you couldn't get scaled <laughs> composites to open their doors. Uh, you think things have changed a little bit since then? <laughs> OK. So um, George was former chief of staff at at NASA during the Obama administration uh, by working with Lori Garber through National Space Society had a nice connection to to get a front row seat or a front row uh, position within NASA and since then uh, Virgin Galactic made such a sweet offer he couldn't resist so um, George is also uh, serving as a co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Space Technologies that's a mouthful and he's co-creator of Yuri's Night, which happens to be my birthday and his wife's birthday. Without any more, George, come on up. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. Uh, great to be with you. I, I sure, Bob, that you've already explained this, but how is it the 20th anniversary uh, if the first one was in 98? Okay, so there was somewhere along the way there, okay, you, you, you get to, okay, all right. I'm not so good at counting, I'm the business guy, so. Anyway, um, thanks a lot, Bob, for inviting me. Nice to have, uh, nice to be here, and, and uh, you know, I, as I always say when I come speak at Mars Society, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, my talk as a young, uh, whatever it was, 23-year-old uh, who didn't know anything, uh, Bob was very kind to let me speak at, at that conference, which was super exciting. And, and I think uh, the ultimate aspirations of all of us to create a better planet, a better solar system for uh, humanity is still something that is worth fighting for. And, and so it's nice to be among uh, friends who consider that. So what I want to do today is just give you a quick update on uh, Galactic and then uh, and Orbit, and, and we can sort of go from there. If anybody has any questions from there, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so we'll just start off and, and shoot right into it. Um, uh, yeah, so here's planet Earth. Um, you know, I, I did want to start with this. Um, my boss, uh, my boss's island just got destroyed uh, yesterday. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that we in the space community have to um, be responsive to what's going on out there. And... Um, you know, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting moment in time uh, when we have two 500-year um, uh, uh, events happening within two-week period, and it, I think it makes all of us reflect about how can space technology help us on planet Earth, and uh, and and how uh, and how that fits into our long-term future. I've never been one to think that those things are incompatible, but I think that um, if we're not sort of uh, responding to that in a, in a substantive way, then uh, the appeal of what we're doing will not, uh, not be uh, sort of as, as deep as it could be. So I think tying things to Earth is important. Uh, here's a little video. Uh, if we can hear it, maybe it could be turned up a little bit. Otherwise, I'll talk over it. Uh, there we go. Space is saving lives today. It is The video is moving, which is like probably about 100% better than normal. This is, uh, you, you know, getting the sound is the, uh, is the minor detail. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yep, yep, maybe not fantastic. We don't have to. Play it, but it's just fun. Making my life better and your life better and everyone else's yeah. life better. 
It's informing the technologies that we use every day to the food that we eat. To the Taking more and more passengers out into space will enable them and us to look both outwards and back, but with a fresh perspective in both directions. Together, we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. And by doing that, we can truly bring positive change to life on Earth. I hope by the time my kids are ready to go into space, we've changed our global culture to recognize that space is where we belong and the Earth is something that, that needs to be a little better protected. We need more and more people to realize how fragile our planet is, how there's not much around us. This is it. Virgin Galactic is developing Launcher One, designed to become the lowest cost per flight private satellite launch vehicle. After all, small satellites can't change the world if they are stuck here on the ground. The fact that more people have signed up to experience space with Virgin Galactic than have ever been to space before is thrilling. And the knowledge Three, that we must repay two, their support by one. making space travel affordable and safe is humbling. But it also inspires us on a daily basis. Um, so, cool, yeah, hardware uh, and some renderings. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we have, uh, this year, what do we do? We spun out our, our orbital satellite launch uh, division. So we now have about uh, 350 people working in Long Beach on a small satellite launcher, uh, which is fantastic. It's, uh, it's in a really cool spot. It's on the north side of the Long Beach airport and it's going to be deployed from a 747. So if you go by the Long Beach Airport, you can actually now see a, uh, a red and white Virgin uh, 747. And uh, so that has now been fitted out to, uh, 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 to have an attachment under the wing. And so that'll be launching um, 300 uh, kilogram uh, missions to, to LEO uh, starting next year. That's really excited and it's exciting, and one of the things that we're very excited about—not the focus of the talk this morning—but is is can you do um, planetary science with small satellites? And that, that's something I'm really excited about. Sort of the principle of like the Star Wars little thing that comes down to Hoth. You know, can you do that with nanosats or microsats um, and distribute these small satellites around the solar system? I think that's a really exciting thing. And if you can pair that with uh, a small satellite launcher, a dedicated small satellite launcher, you could actually be doing planetary exploration for maybe 20 million rather than 200 million or 2 billion. And just think of uh, how much more science we can do on some of those things. Uh, really exciting stuff, maybe to Mars. Um, but, uh, you know, so Galactic is still trucking away, and um, we are getting close to powered flight, which is exciting with our new vehicle, uh, Spaceship Unity. I'll show you a little bit about that. So that's, that's Unity. You can tell it's the, 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 the new one with the shiny stuff in the background. And I think everybody knows basically what uh, we're trying to do, which is suborbital uh, space flight. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about pilots or anything. I just want to talk about the space flight um, uh, uh, program or the test flight program mostly. Although I, I did want to talk about suborbital missions. We're, we're pushing hard on this now, and we've got a whole bunch of um, uh, researchers who are going to be doing suborbital science uh, on board the vehicles, which will be uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know if we have anybody from Irvine yet, but we should definitely get some folks um, from Irvine flying on the vehicle. Um, yeah, so I just want to talk about uh, the test flight program because that's something that people are interested in. So uh, we're now right at the edge of powered flight. So we have um, um, probably a uh, very small number of glide flights left before we start powered flight, which will be a great milestone. Um, so I just wanted to sort of review what's happened over the last um, you know, year or so. So we started out um, glide flights with Spaceship Unity uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and um, <coughs> we started out with, with captive carry flights just to make sure that the, ships, the ship was working uh, properly. <coughs> that, that was fine. And, uh, and then we moved into glide flights. So we're doing all of our glide flights in Mojave, uh, California, about um, two to three hours north of here. Um, 
in a different environment, uh, but uh, a nice one. And uh, then we moved into feather testing. So this is uh, actuating the feather, as, as everybody knows probably, or many people know, basically what we do with our vehicle is we bend the, uh, the booms of the wing up at about a 60 degree angle for re-entry. And that's meant to uh, enable us to sort of slow down higher up in the atmosphere, reduces heating loads, and, uh, and, and ensures a more stable aerody aerodynamic configuration for, for re-entry. Um, and so we went through those tests, that seems to be fine. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we're doing a bunch of engine testing. Um, uh, that's now uh, done, so we're ready to go into powered flight. Here's a video of a uh, test that we did in May, just for fun. <laughs> So the rocket motor is uh, it's about a 60,000 pound thrust um, motor. It is the, uh, I think, the most advanced hybrid rocket motor that's ever been built. Um, hybrid rocket motors are hard, uh, but uh, our engineering team has done a great job at uh, working on that. Um, so this particular stand is sort of the final, um, uh, I don't know, I stopped, but anyway, um, basically it's the, uh, the final phase of qualification, which is now uh, uh, essentially done. So um, this, this allows us, you can see it sort of like looks like the spaceship in the back. So basically that's an accurate model of the spaceship and allows us to basically um, uh, test out uh, all the plumbing and all the systems um, in the vertical configuration, which is of course what the spaceship will be doing as we go, uh, as we go up. And so um, very soon, we'll be mounting that motor onto the spaceship and uh, beginning um, powered flight test, which is going to be, which is going to be pretty exciting. Um, so anyway, that's good. Uh, so we're also building two more spaceships now. Um, uh, and actually, we bonded the <coughs> cabin of one of them. Whoops, I don't want to show that yet. Um, bonded the cabin of one of them. So basically, uh, uh, you know, we have also built up uh, an entire manufacturing organization in Mojave called the Spaceship Company, which is a fantastic organization. I'm the CEO of that as well, and uh, that's about 400 people, uh, and it can basically do, um, uh, you know, anything related to the spaceship manufacturing and test program. So uh, design spaceships, manufacture them, test them, and operate them. We have our own dedicated facilities for mission control, for all the different aspects of, of the, uh, of the uh, process in constructing spaceships. Um, and so uh, this is just a picture of, of a, a month or two ago. You can see the cabin halves for the, for the next spaceships there. And um, yeah, I want to show you a little video on about TSC because many people don't really know about that company very much. So that's TSC. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a picture of the cabin halves that we made it yesterday. And uh, so hopefully, you know, relatively soon, give it a year or two, we'll have two new spaceships coming out uh, as well, which will be exciting. So, you know, the aspiration is to have a fleet of vehicles operating from New Mexico, our, our home base there in Spaceport America, as well as other places um, potentially down the road. Um, but uh, it's exciting to start having uh, that. And we think that that's important because from a business perspective, we need to have like essentially the capacity to um, build up uh, 
you know, um, more people going into space, and, and that's, what it's, that's what it's all about. Um, so I think uh, that's sort of, I, yeah, I wanted to keep it quick so in case we had any uh, questions or anything like that, but let me just close by saying, you know, we're at a really interesting moment from uh, the perspective of space development right now. Um, as Bob and others have sort of intelligently commented on, we've moved from sci science fiction to, you know, science fact. Uh, when I was in government, we put a lot of effort on the importance of uh, competition. Um, and I think that that is uh, super important for the future of space. Um, if we have these monolithic programs, uh, you don't see the competition, you don't see the innovation that uh, you can get if you do have people competing against each other and trying to make better products, make lower cost products, and that's important. That's really important because um, we've seen more innovation in the last five or 10 years in space than we've seen in probably 30 years. And that is awesome because that's the only way that we're gonna achieve our dreams is by unleashing the power of the human uh, you know, spirit. And, uh, and that's terrific. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And I think, um, you know, uh, we got to keep that going, you know. Um, so it's hard, right? We've seen various companies uh, fail, fade away, you know, whatever. Um, but what's exciting is that there are several companies that are building, you know, major revolutions in space access, several companies building major revolutions in in-space uh, services. And... Uh, what a great time. That's fantastic. And we, we got we to gotta encourage that. We got to sort of <clears throat> enjoy that and, and, and support that. Because, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, slow plotting progress is super boring. And, you know, we're only on this planet for about, I don't know about you, probably 100 years. Um, and so, you know, that's a remarkably short period of time. You know, as I reach my second half of life, I started to think about, man, we got to get going. And uh, so, you know, I know we feel that at Galactic, but, you know, you got to do it right. But you, you, you have to keep moving quickly and because uh, the solar system is big and Earth has a lot of challenges. And, and space can respond to those challenges, can, I think, be integral to the long-term future of the planet and humanity. So that means, you know, this vision of, creating sort of an Eden-like, uh, um, you know, home planet. I mean, I think that's a really inspiring vision, you know, uh, and, and, and then taking advantage of the resources of the solar system. Those are all really inspiring visions that I think we can get kids excited by, get, uh, get us all excited by, and, and keep moving uh, forward because we need that positive energy. We need to be bringing more people into the importance of space for our shared future. And uh, so I think it's a really exciting moment. Um, uh, yeah, and if we can, if we can uh, you know, just keep, keep going, keep everybody excited, and, and keep moving forward. So anyway, I have time for maybe a couple of quick questions, and, and then we can move on to whoever's next. Uh, I don't know how you want to do it. Yeah. Oh, well, it seems to me that what people really want to do is uh, to go, go into a, 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 a orbit around Earth, you know, two or three times uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any plans in the future for any orbital uh, trips or what? Sure, we'd, we'd love to do orbit. I mean, that'd be great. But, um, you know, I think for the time being, that's probably going to be in the tens of millions of dollars. And I just think it's a smaller market, right? I mean, I don't know. Do you want, you want to? <laughs> I don't know. If you want to. My, I, uh, I think, um, you know, here's what we want to do. We want to, at Virgin, we want to dramatically expand access to space. And that means that we have to be different than a price point that's in the tens of millions. A hundreds of thousands of dollars is still not cheap, but it's two orders of magnitude less, almost three orders of magnitude less than what NASA is paying the Russians right now for space access. Obviously, it's a different thing. But, um, you know, widening that base and having you know, hundreds and eventually thousands and then tens of thousands of people going into space, I think is going to have a transformational impact on our planet, on communities around the planet. And so starting with that, it's going to be a relatively short trip, but it's going to change their lives. And we're going to, you know, move on someday to orbit. I'd love to go to orbit. That'd be, I agree. Let's do it. But, you know, we got to start somewhere. Uh, yeah. Who's got the mic? Yeah. Hello. Uh, 
where will your new spaceships go in our planetary system, and what is your plan and timeline for beginning the human, the human exploration of Mars? I know it's a long <laughs> right, term, because we're at the Mars think? Society conference, right? Um, uh, we're starting with suborbital travel, so that means basically just shooting up into space uh, and coming down. And you know, take off to landing. That's an hour and a half, order of magnitude. Um, I think Richard Branson, my boss, would love to participate or be involved in future expeditions to other planets, um, including Mars. Um, but we're approaching in a stepwise fashion. We want to get into commercial operation with the suborbital uh, ship, and then uh, and also with Launcher One, which is our orbital thing, and then and then we'll go from there. There's a question from the lady right there. Can we get can we get have her? Maybe you can just yell it out. Totally, yeah, I love them. The, we have young people, you know, like, uh, who are working on them all the time, and I think it's great. It, so thank you for that. I'll pass that along. I had a question over here. Yeah. All right, so I just turned 19, so it's a huge inspiration to see you here. And I'm actually a business major, so a lot of the engineering stuff goes over my head, and I want to do, you know, management in space and yeah. be one of those helping hands. Mm -hmm. So right after university, what did you do to start on that path to get you into these positions at NASA and at Galactic? Uh, right after college, I worked for a guy named Dave Thompson. Uh, I, I was his, I started out as his executive intern, uh, and by the end of it, I had talked him into special assistant to the CEO. But uh, anyway, um, uh, Dave is the CEO of, of Orbital ATK, and that was a great experience. I, I think um, getting yourself, uh, this is a great, this is the advice I give to young people. Um, first of all, awesome. Go for it. Second of all, I'm not an engineer either, as is obvious from my counting error with uh, Bob earlier. Um, but uh, third of all, uh, just talk to a lot of people, determine who the most exciting people are or the most dynamic people are that you, and then just figure out some way to work with them. Don't worry too much about the life architecture plan because, as we all know, life changes. But like, if you start off with some exciting people in roughly the area, you'll go far. And I'd love to talk with you afterwards, too, to help you out. Yeah. Um, from a business perspective, as you said, you're looking to open it up to as many people as possible. Um, one of the big differences is you're dealing then with everyday people compared to astronauts or fighter pilots. Are you at all concerned about the health of everyday people when it comes to the G-forces they're dealing with, such as blacking out, having a neck injury, liability, or screening? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So what we did um, relatively early on was we took um, like uh, our first chunk of customers, sort of like our first 100 customers, and we put them through a centrifuge where we could precisely mimic the higher G portions of the experience. Um, because obviously it is, an, it is an issue. We're going to be taking a lot of people who are not trained fighter pilots or, you know, uh, up on a, on a fairly uh, adventurous trajectory. And the good news is that pretty much everybody did, did great. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the lesson that I learned is that high G is something that you can train almost anybody for, including people up through their 80s, including, you know, teenagers. You know, it, it's a trainable thing. It's not that hard but it's very useful to go through some high G before you actually go into the real thing. So what we're trying to do is to encourage, and we may, we may put it into the training package, encourage everybody to have that high G experience in advance so that they know the techniques to have the best experience possible. And, and we have a dedicated medical staff. Uh, we have doctors on staff, uh, including some folks who've spent a lot of time in the NASA astronaut program and they're advising us as well on, on uh, medical cases for, for them uh, as well. What do you think, one more question or, uh, or a couple more, me. whatever? So, yeah. so after a successful you're... space tourism, oh, uh, will you plan for a moon mission or Mars mission? Because I guess everyone is interested in Mars mission. But, yes, uh, I've gotten that I sense. I guess our rival are, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, I pushed hard for, uh, I've been pushing, for Mars my entire life. And I, and I absolutely think it's, it's, an, it's a critical thing for the human uh, species to, to do. I think what's going to enable that in a big way is dramatically bringing down the cost of, of space access. And also, yes, there we go. 
uh, and also, uh, you know, working on in space, um, uh, you know, anyway, m making sure that people can live, live in space for a while. And, and so if we can bring that cost down through reusability, obviously you have uh, three companies now doing a lot of work in reusable space access. Um, and, uh, you know, that will have a big impact on being able to put stuff into space that we can then send to Mars and other places. Yeah. Yep, I think, um, I, yeah, happy to, uh, you know. Uh, back to the uh, orbit, yeah. uh, Virgin orbit. Uh, I'm, um, I'm Don V. Black. I'm interested in, uh, my company is Digital Sats, and we're interested in uh, what you do uh, in ferrying uh, uh, satellites from LEO to GEO. Will you have the capability of docking with a... Uh, uh, object that's already in orbit. What are you going to do with the uh, spacecraft when you're done with it? Just so we we basically have two different spacecraft. It's a good question. So the the small satellite launch vehicle, which you saw a little video of the thing going off the 747, that'll just put something into low Earth orbit. You know, so it can dock with something if it wanted to. It it could do all kinds of things. Um, the uh, suborbital spacecraft, you know, basically just goes into space and comes out. It doesn't reach orbital velocity. So it won't be able to dock with anything. Um, the gentleman up here asked, uh, sorry, did I answer your question? Um, the gentleman up here was asking when we're gonna start commercial service, and the answer is when we're done with the test flight program. So, um, you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta wait until we think it's safe. Um, yeah, but it's sort of internal. Whenever I release it, then all the journalists, then, you know, whatever. I think it's best to just let the engineers do the work and go from there. Um, yep. Okay. Um, since you're building a critical part of the inst uh, the infrastructure to get to Mars, um, you'll eventually need to put something like, as he said, an IDSS docking collar on the spacecraft somewhere probably in the five to ten year time frame because you're going to be delivering a lot of people to orbit and that's very essential as the first leg of getting there. So it's not as if you aren't part of the Mars program, it's you're a very essential part of the Mars program. You have to get out of the gravity well first to get there. Well said. All right, thanks everybody, good to see you. <laughs>